Chapter 6 As the memorial library clock struck one in the distance, Norman finished topping up the battered woodbine machine outside his corner shop. He locked the crumbling dispenser of coffin nails and pocketed Pooley's two washers, which made their usual weekly appearance in the cash tray amongst the legitimate coin of the realm. Norman re-entered his shop and bolted the door behind him, turning the open sign to closed. As he crossed the mottled linoleum, he whistled softly to himself. Sadly, as he'd not yet retrieved his wayward teeth, the air sounded a little obscure. For some reason, Norman had never quite got the hang of humming, so he contented himself with a bit of unmelodic finger-popping and what he described as a touch of the old Fred and Jedgers as he vanished away through the door behind the counter and left his shop to gather dust for another Wednesday afternoon. Norman's kitchenette served him as the traditional shopkeeper's lair, equipped with its obligatory bar fire and gas ring. But there, apart from these necessary appliances, all similarities ended. There was much of the alchemist den about Norman's kitchenette. It was workroom, laboratory, research establishment, testing station and storage place for his somewhat excessive surplus stock of Danish glossies. At present, the hellishly crowded retreat was base camp and ground control for Norman's latest and most ambitious project to date. If a NASA boffin cast his knowledgeable eye over the curious array of electronic hocus-pocus which now filled the tiny room, it was unlikely that he would have fathomed any purpose behind it all. The walls were lined with computer banks bristling with ancient radio valves and constructed from sunray wireless sets and commandeered seed boxes. The floor was a veritable snake house of cables. The overall effect was one to set Heath Robinson spinning gaily in his grave. Norman spat dangerously on his palms and rubbed them together. He picked his way carefully across the floor until he reached a great switchboard of a type once favoured by Baron von Frankenstein. As Norman squared up before it, however, he had no intention of mouthing the now legendary words We belong dead, but instead lisped a quick Here she goes before doing the business. With a violent flash and a sparkle of fizz, the grotesque apparatus sprang, or more accurately, lurched into life. Lights twinkled upon the consoles and valves glowed dimly orange. Little pops and crackles, suggestive of constant electrical malfunction, broke out here and there, accompanied by a thin blue mist and an acrid smell which was music to Norman's nostrils. The shopkeeper lowered himself onto an odd-legged kitchen chair before his master console and began to unwrap his tiny brown paper parcel. Peeling back the cotton wool wadding, he exposed an exquisite little piece of circuitry which he lifted carefully with a pair of flatless tweezers and examined through an oversized magnifying glass. It was beautiful, perfect in every degree, the product of craftsmanship and skill well beyond the perception of most folk. Norman whistled through his gums. Superbs, he said, superbs. He slotted the tiny thing into a polished housing upon the console, and it slipped in with a pleasurable click, the last tiny piece in a large and very complicated jigsaw. Norman clapped his hands together and rocked backwards and forwards upon his chair. It was all complete, all ready and waiting for a trial run. He had but to select two suitable areas of land, and then, if all his calculations were correct, Norman's hand hovered over the console, and it trembled not a little. His calculations surely were correct, weren't they? Norman took down a clipboard and began to make ticks against a long and intricate list which had been built up over many months, scribbled in variously coloured inks. As his biro travelled down the paper, Norman's memory travelled with it through those long, long months of speculation, theory, planning and plotting, of begging, borrowing and building. The sleepless nights, the trepidation and the doubts, most of all the doubts. What if it all came to nothing? What if it didn't work? He damn near bankrupted himself over this one. What if the entire concept was a nonsense? Norman sucked upon the end of his by roar. No, it couldn't be wrong. Old Albert E. had discontinued his researches on it back in 1927, but the essential elements were still sound. It had to be correct. Just because Einstein had bottled out the last moment didn't mean it couldn't be done. Norman ticked off the final item on the list. It was all there, all present and correct, all shipshape and Bristol fashion, all just waiting for the off. He had but to choose two areas of land suitable for the test. His hand had a little more hovering. He, like certain sportsmen in the vicinity, had no wish to draw attention to his project before its completion. Caution was the byword. 
The two tracts of land, one local and one in the area of the object he sought, would have to be unoccupied at the present time. The latter was no problem. Norman boldly punched in the coordinates he knew so well. 30 degrees longitude, 30 degrees latitude and the minutiae of minutes. But as to a local site, this presented some difficulties. It was his aim to conduct the final experiment during the hours of darkness when there would be few folk about to interfere. But for now, a little test run? Norman snapped his fingers. Eureka's, he whistled, taking up a Brentford Street directory and thumbing through the dogged pages. The ideal spot, the St Mary's allotment. The day being hot, all those dedicated tillers of God's good earth would by now be resting their leathern elbows upon the swan's bar counter and lying about the dimensions of their marrows. Norman punched in the appropriate coordinates and leant back in his chair, waiting for the power to build up sufficiently for transference to occur. He crossed his fingers, lisped what words he knew of the Latin litany, and pressed a blood-red button which had until recently been the property of the local fire brigade. A low purring arose from the electronic throat of the machinery, accompanied by a pulse-like beating. The lights upon the console sprang into redoubled illumination, and the radio valves began to pulsate, expanding and contracting like some vertical crop of transparent onions. The little bulbs blinked in enigmatic sequences, passing back and forwards through the spectrum. Norman clapped his hands together and bobbed up and down in his chair. A thick blue smoke began to fill the room as the humming of the machinery rose several octaves into an ear-splitting whine. A strange pressure made itself felt in the kitchenette as if the gravitational field was being slowly increased. Norman suddenly realised that he was unable to raise his hands from the console or his feet from the floor, and someone or something was apparently lowering two hundred weight sacks of cement onto his shoulders. His ears popping sickeningly, he gritted his gums and made a desperate attempt to keep his eyelids up. The ghastly whining and the terrible pressure increased. The lights grew brighter and brighter, and the pulse beat ever faster. The apparatus was beginning to vibrate. Window panes tumbled from their dried putty housings, and a crack swept across the ceiling. Beneath closed lids, Norman's eyes were thoroughly crossed. Without grace, he left his chair and travelled downwards at great speed towards the linoleum. All over Brentford, electrical appliances were beginning to fail, kettles ceased their whistlings, television pictures suddenly shrank to the size of matchboxes, the automated beer pumps at the new inn trickled to a halt in mid-floor, and at the swan, the lights went out, leaving the rear section of the saloon bar in darkness and the patrons blindly searching for their pints. O'Malley groaned. "'It's the end of the world as we know it,' he said. "'We should never have got up so early today.' Pooley, who had carrots the night before, topped up his pint from the Irishman's glass. Steady on, John, he said in a soothing voice. It's a power cut, nothing more. We've been getting them more or less every Wednesday afternoon for months now. But not like this! Old Pete's dog, Chip, set up a dismal howl, which was unexpectedly taken up by Neville, the part-time barman. Look at it! Look at it! he wailed, pointing invisibly in the darkness. Look at that bloody thing! Pato, 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 went the Captain Laser alien attack machine, scornfully indifferent to the whims of the Southern Electricity Board, or anyone else for that matter. In the tiny kitchenette to the rear of the corner shop, there was a sharp and deafening twang, and a great bolt of lightning burst forth, charring the walls and upturning the banks of pulsating equipment. There followed a moment or two of very extreme silence. Smoke hung heavily in the air, cables swung to and fro like smouldering yander vines, and the general atmosphere of the players had more than the hint of the charnel house about it. At length, from beneath the fallen wreckage, something stirred. Slowly, and with much coughing, gasping, and sighing, a blackened, toothless figure rose painfully to his feet. He now lacked not only his upper set, but also his eyebrows, and sported a fetching, if somewhat bizarre, charcoal forelock. He kicked away the debris and fumbled about amidst the heaps of burned-out valves and twisted gubbins. Yuck, he said, suddenly wielding a smoke-veiled gauge into view. Yes, I think. Something had come through, and by the measurement upon that gauge it was relatively substantial, goodly few hundredweight of something. Norman wiped away a few loose eyelashes with a grimy knuckle, satisfied himself that there was no immediate danger of fire, and sought his overcoat. Small Dave had finished his midday deliveries and was taking his usual shortcut back from the butts estate towards the flying swan for a well-deserved pint of large. As he shuffled across the allotment, his size four feet kicking up little dusty explosions, he whistled a plaintive lament, the title of which he had long forgotten. 
He had not travelled twenty yards down the path, however, when he caught sight of something which made him halt mid-pierce and doubt that sanity which so many had previously doubted in him. Small Dave took off his cap and wiped it across his eyes. Was this a mirage, he wondered, or was he seeing things? Something over-large and definitely out of place was grazing amongst his cabbages. It was a foul and scruffy-looking something of bulky proportion, and it was emitting dismal grumbling sounds between great munches upon his prize-winning Pringlia Antiscorbatica. Dave screwed up his eyes. Could this be the Sasquatch, perhaps, or the Surrey Puma? Possibly it was the giant feral torn which, legend held, stopped the allotments by night. The postman drew cautiously nearer, keeping even law to the ground than cruel feared had naturally decreed. Ahead of him the creature's outline became more clearly defined, and small Dave knew that at least he was staring upon a beast of a known genus, although this gave him little in the way of consolation. The thing was of the genus Camels Bactrianus. It was a camel. Small Dave's thoughts all became a little confused at this moment. He was never very good when it came to confrontation with the unexpected. Arriving with a six-inch letter to discover a five-inch letterbox was enough to set him foaming at the mouth. Now a camel on the allotment, a camel that was eating his precious cabbages, that was something quite in a class by itself. Dave's first thought, naturally enough, was that the thing should be driven off without delay. His second was that it was a very large camel, and that, as a species, camels are notoriously malevolent creatures who do not take kindly to interference during mealtimes. His third was that they are also valuable, and there would no doubt be a handsome reward for anyone who should return astray. His fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh thoughts were loosely concerned with circuses, Roman showmen who were apt to snatch dwarves away for side chores, an old Todd Browning movie he'd once seen, and the rising cost of cabbages. Small Dave's lower lip began to tremble, and a look of complete imbecility spread over his gnomish countenance. He dithered a moment or two, not knowing what to do, flapped his hands up and down as if in an attempt to gain flight, gave a great cry of despair, took to his heels, and finally ran screaming from the allotment. He had not been gone but a moment or two when a soot-besmirched head arose from behind a nearby water butt. Apart from its lack of teeth and eyebrows, it bore a striking resemblance to Sir Laurence Olivier in his famous portrayal of Othello. A broad and slightly lunatic smile cleft the blackened face in two, and a wicked chuckle arose in the throat of the watcher. Shuck, shuck, indeed, whistled Norman, rubbing his hands together and dancing out from his hiding place. With a quick glance about to assure himself that he was now alone, he skipped over to the cabbage-chewing camel and snatched up its trailing halter line. Hush, hush, he said, Imshiella. With hardly the slightest degree of persuasion and little or no force at all, Norman led the surprisingly docile brute away. From behind Soap Distance Padlock's shed, yet another figure now emerged. This one wore a grey coverall suit, was of average height, with a slightly tanned complexion and high cheekbones. He looked for all the world like a young Jack Palance. Through oval amber eyes, he watched the shopkeeper and his anomalous charge depart. Drawing from a concealed pocket an instrument somewhat resembling a brass divining rod, he traced a runic symbol into the dusty soil of the allotment, and then also departed upon light and silent feet.